Let's see if that goes through. Oh, there we go. So I'm going to get started a little bit early since we already have a packed house. So this is Generator Showcase Showdown uh, at PyCon Spain 2013. My name is James Powell. I get to be one of the token English speakers at this conference. I have to say for me it's a huge honor. I've sat in on a lot of talks so far. They've all been fantastic. Um, if you put what you're saying in the slides, it actually improves my chances that I'll understand it, but I have been able to tweet a couple of neat things that I've seen. I'm going to give this entire talk in English. I'm going to speak very quickly because there's a lot of material. Thankfully, we're being videotaped, so if you need to, you can watch it later and slow me down until it's understandable. Although I can't promise that you'll be able to understand me at any speed. Um, let me start with some brief introductions and then we'll launch into it. So my name is James Powell. Uh, I am probably most proud in all of the accomplishments of my life, most proud of this thing right here, the New York City Python Meetup Group. It is the second largest Python Meetup Group in the world. The first largest is a Boston Group. We have about 4,000 members. but We are probably the most active Python Meetup Group in the world. We have study groups on Saturday and Sunday. We have office hours on Tuesdays. We have two headline events that get a crowd like this every month. It is an enormously active, but also very, very warm and welcoming community. Uh, it's something that we've been building up to the point where we're actually turning it into a federal nonprofit, and we're going to begin to do things like send people over to conferences like PyCon Spain, and maybe even bring some Spanish speakers over to conferences in the United States. Um, so this, this, is the, this is my really big thing. Um, also, I'm on Twitter, of course, and I've been tweeting a little bit about the conference. And the notes for this, and I'll leave this up for a few seconds, the notes for this are on GitHub. Let me stick at com there. So, so that's, that's where the notes are. It's, in a, it's an IPython notebook, so I would suggest that you download it if you plan to download it. Everyone ready to go? OK. So this is who I am. That's how you can contact me. And we're going to launch into generators. So who here, just as a show of hand, knows what a generator is? Who here knows what a coroutine is? Who here knows what this does? Everyone loves this. This is, this is a, Anyone who's ever seen this talk before lo loves this part. Who here knows what this does in Python 3.3? Who here knows what that does? Anyone? I think, I think one person in the back knows because I've showed it to them before. So you can see that generators are actually a very deep and very rich topic. Um, and there's some really weird and wild stuff that you can do with them. I'm going to go over some introductions to what generators are from the perspective of generators as one of the fundamental concepts in Python. Then I'm going to show you some interesting approaches that generators allow us, and interesting approaches to modeling and to conceptualizing problems. So I usually start this by talking about functions versus generators. And I think that at the most superficial level, we can look at the formal characteristics of functions and generators. We can say that here's a sample function. And you can see we define it. It has a return. And then we use it by just putting parentheses after it and calling it with some input variable. And it performs a calculation and returns the result to us immediately. It is eager. The calculation runs to completion. And we get the entire calculation the moment we invoke the function. A generator, however, has only very slightly different formal characteristics. Instead of return, we have yield, and we may have multiple yields. And when we invoke it, we have to then iterate through it in order to get the values out. So formally, we can see that there's some similarity. They're both callables. We can call them and produce a value. But most fundamentally, the difference is functions evaluate eagerly, immediately, and give you the entire computation. Generators give you the computation lazily only as you ask for it, and they require iteration through, or they use iteration as a protocol for getting the next computations. One thing that you may have heard about are generator expressions. And I don't talk too much about generator expressions because they're actually just a subset of generators. Namely, when you invoke a generator object, 
you get a generator instance. And a generator expression can be thought of as merely an inline generator instance. So I don't go into too much depth about them. Um, I would say that once you understand how generators work, generator expressions are merely some very convenient syntax that give you access to the same internals. So this is one thing that I've been plugging for a very, very long time, um, which is fundamental protocols in Python. As I see it, Python is a language that's built around ad hoc protocols. Um, you can see this very explicitly in the C source code. So you have a file called abstract.c. And in abstract.c, you actually have listings of some of these protocols, like pi mapping, or pi sequence, or you know, all the pi object get item set items. You can see that what's happened is we have certain abstract interactions between objects in the system. And we can define these interactions by means of protocols. So things that look like numbers. We define addition, multiplication, division. And we implement these by, by implementing underscore add, underscore div, underscore mul, underscore rmul. Similarly, we have some abstract concept of iterability. And iterability, well, actually that should be callables. Uh, we, have, we have an abstract notion of iterability. And iterability is iter and next. And we have an abstract notion of callability. So I want to start by looking at callability. You have some, ob some object in Python, and you can put two parentheses after it. And this is what's called calling it. Back in the old days, there used to be a function called apply. And apply would take an object and just invoke this underscore call function. It would call pi object call object and just invoke it. So what we have is we have a fundamental protocol. Namely, you have some object, and you put two parentheses after it. And we have some implementation of it. And you can see that you can work within this implementation very freely. The underlying object doesn't necessarily have to, or the knowledge of the underlying object doesn't, isn't necessary when you're actually calling it. Or to put it another way, you can put those two parentheses after something, and you don't have to know what that thing is. It could be a generator, it could be a function, it could be a class, it could be a type, it could be some custom object like this. And you can see in this case, the custom object can implement whatever logic you want. And all you're doing is providing some ability to put these two parentheses after it. You can do some wild stuff like make it a static method. Um, and you can even check to see, does, it, does this object adhere to the callability protocol by saying, is it an instance of callable? And all that'll do is check to see, can you actually call it and get something out? Similarly, we have some abstract generalization of iterability. <coughs> iterability means you can take some object and you can, see, you can get sub subsequent values out of it. So for example, lists, we've iterated over lists from the time we started using Python until today. But we can also implement some sort of abstract iterable object. And that's ju just like in the call example, we implement an iter and a next, or a, a next with underscores or not underscores, depending on whether you're using Python 2 or Python 3. And the logic in here can be any custom logic you want. And all this means is you have an object, and if you try to iterate over it, i.e. call next, or put it in a for x in blank statement, you'll actually be able to get values out. Now, the interesting thing is that when we talk about things like iterables and iterators, all of this is merely some implementation of a specific protocol. Namely, an iterator is merely something that you can iterate over that keeps track of where its state is. So this is actually not only an iterable, but also an iterator. Because you see we have this variable here, self.state, that knows what the state in the iteration is. Or to put it another way, you have a list. And a list, you can iterate over. It's an iterable. But the list itself doesn't know where you stopped when you were looking at subsequent values. So you create a list iterator object. And the list iterator object has a reference to the actual underlying data and some knowledge of where you stopped in looking at this. This is actually a fundamental concept and con conceptualization necessary for understanding generators. You can think of a generator as merely a function that has some underlying data, namely computations, lines of source code, and has some notion of where you stopped in the computation. So just like with the list, you have elements 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and you have some notion of, OK, I, I looked at 1, and now I looked at 2, now I looked at 3, and now I looked at 4, and now I looked at 5. A generator is merely a function where those elements are lines of source code, and the generator object knows what was the last line of source code that you executed. And you delimit these elements, instead of by commas, you delimit them by the yield statement. 
So that's all, uh, that's all a generator really is. It's, really, it's just a bunch of code that's delimited by yield statements that you can iterate through to, get laz to lazily perform computations. However, there is this thing called coroutines. And coroutines were introduced into Python after generators were first introduced. Um, they're actually an expansion of uh, the generator mechanisms. If you go on to Wikipedia and you look for a coroutine, well, if you go on to es.wikipedia.org, I have no idea what you'll find. But if you look on the English Wikipedia uh, for coroutines, you'll see that it says something about coroutines as a generalization of subroutines. And it sounds a little highfalutin. It sounds a little uh, very ivory tower and abstract. But essentially, when we talk about coroutines, we're merely contrasting them to subroutines, where a function is a subroutine, where you have one entry point, you call it with some input, and one exit point, you return some output. A generator coroutine is something where you can put input into it at multiple stages, and you can get output out of it at multiple stages. So here's our initial generator that yielded two values. There was a computation here and a computation here, delimited by the yield statement. And as you iterate through it, you perform this computation, then it waits, then you perform this computation, and then it terminates. If you, if you want to turn this into a coroutine, what you can do at each of these stages is instead of performing just the next computation, you can actually accept input back into that. And you do this by means of an additional set of protocols built on top of generators, namely next, well, namely send, close, and throw. So we've looked at next, and next is just a protocol on top of generators, just like for each one of the fundamental protocols in Python, like len. Some, ob some, sequence, or some, some sequence has an abstract notion of what its length is. And you have a len top-level function in built-ins. You have a underscore len in your data model. You have a pi object length in the actual C Python source code. Similarly, you have call. So you have a top level apply, you have an underscore call, you have a pi object call whatever in your CPython layer. You have next, iter and next. Next, you have a top level function next. You have an underscore function next in Python 3, and it's just a raw next in Python 2. Uh, and you have, you have in the C source code an, an equivalent that just calls the next element. And all this does is retrieve the next element. You also have throw and close, which are very specific to operational necessities of using generators. So when you start to use generators to model large computations, you may need to, put, you may need to throw exceptions at certain points of the control flow or close it. I, I don't find them to be particularly motivating. They're, they're, they're useful in the concept of being able to use generators, but they're not really a motivation for using them. So I, don't, I, don't, I won't talk about them in too much depth. The one I really want to talk about is send. In the previous case, we were just performing computations and returning values. What I'm showing you here is that you can actually receive input at that stage where you resume the com computation. So in the case of a function, you get some input value, you perform some computation eagerly to its conclusion, and you return the completed result. With the generator, you get some input, and then you perform some subset of a computation demarcated by yield. You pause, return control flow back to the caller, and then at that stage, the caller is able to reintroduce input into the structure. So what can happen here is I have a generator instantiated with 10, and I call next to get the next value out. It'll run all the code up to here, so it'll yield x plus 1 and y. So you can see 11 and none. And then I can send a value back into it. So I can say, at this stage, send ABC back in, assign it to Y, then perform this computation. So the next line will give me X plus 2, which is 12, and Y, which is ABC. And at this stage, I could send another value back into it. Although notice, since I don't have a yield statement here, I won't ever see it come out. So I could probably send, oh, I could probably send another value into there if I so desired. So you send. And you can see, at this point, I actually hit a stop iteration because I performed the entirety of the computation. One thing that everybody runs into when they start to, when they start to take their generators and turn them into coroutines is a huge wart in Python. And I don't like to talk about it, but I feel that I have to talk about it because it pops up all over the place. 
every large library that uses generators internally runs into this problem and you'll see some helper that's called either pump or prime or initialize or start which is here I have a generator and say I want to send a value back into it before I get a value out of it so I put an initial value in here as x then I want to run the computation here but you can see between the actual initialization of the generator and the return of this first value, there's nowhere for any subsequent values to go. So when I call send on this, I get this weird nasty error here. Can't send none non value to a just started generator. And you're going to run into this a lot. The answer to this is that the first time you yield from a generator, you must always do send none, which is equal to just g.next, which is the same thing as next to g. There's one problem where when you're putting input values back into the generator, you don't, as a result of the syntax, you don't have a place to put them before you get one answer out of it. So as a consequence, you end up with kind of ugly code. And in the examples I'll show you later, each one of them is going to have some decorator called pump or prime that's going to show, just going to work around this little hack. If you look at Twisted, Twisted has one of these. Every one of these big generator libraries ends up having to solve this problem in one way or the other. One thing I want to talk about before we get into the conceptualizations of generators and some of the things that they allow you to model is my second favorite library in all of, Py in all of this Python C stand uh, standard library. So for the last conference I spoke at, PyData, I made some cards just to let people know about the, about the meetup group. Um, the PyData was actually based in New York City. And my organization helped organize that conference. I was on the speaker selection committee. One of our organizers was putting together a women in technology forum. Uh, so I wanted to let people know about it, and I wanted to hand out cards. And on the back of the cards, I thought, I, I, made, them very, I made them last minute. I made them on a Wednesday to be used on a Friday, rush order. So, on the back of, so they're very simple. But on the back of the cards, I chose six different modules, what I called fun conversation starters. And one of the modules was iter tools. The other one was dis. So if you were here on Friday for the CPython workshop, I showed dis. I also have some fun conversation starters around C types. I have another one around functools.reduce and, and things like that. Now, I actually showed these to a friend of mine who wasn't a programmer and he, to see what do you think of the cards? Do you like the, the layout of them? And he said, well, what's that weird program statement you have on the back? And I said, well, actually, it's a fun conversation starter. So I wrote out a really long email explaining each one of them to him. And he responded to me with one line saying, I wonder if there's a word in some language that means I immediately regret asking that question. <laughs> so <laughs> if you want, come up to me after this talk or sometimes tomorrow. I'm speaking again tomorrow. And I'll give you one of the cards. And I'll give you a conversation about one of these modules. But right now, I'm going to give you the conversation about iter tools, which I think is a fantastic module for dealing with generators and other iterables. Iter tools contains a collection of what I like to call generalizations, helpers, and algorithms. So if you look at iter tools, you see some things that are generalizations. One of the main design decisions I think made in the transition between Python 2 and Python 3 was to generalize iteration from being concrete iteration to abstract iteration. Or to put it another way, we know with the list, we can slice the list from element 1 to 5. And we know we can do the same thing for a string, and we might be able to do the same thing for a tuple. But can we do the same thing for a generator? No. But you, you should be able to, because you can get the first element, and you can get the fifth element. So you should have some generalized way to slice into an object, right? And that's just iSlice. Similarly, you should have some generalized way to zip two sequences together, to map a function over a sequence, to filter actually over an iterable, to filter elements out of an iterable. And what were zip, map, and filter in Python 2, and our iZip, iMap, iFilter in Python 2 are actually now the regular zip, map, and filter in Python 3. To put it another way, these three are generalizations of map, zip, and filter to work on anything that can be iterated over, as opposed to only on concrete data types like lists and strings and tuples, or tuples. How do you say tuple in Spanish? Okay. Very good. Additionally, iter tools contains helpers. So we know that we can concatenate two lists. And I'm sure everybody's been in the midst of a source code base, and they tried to concatenate a list 
with something else. I didn't know what that other thing was. And I thought it was a list. And it blew up in their face saying, I can't concatenate the list with a tuple. And you just wish the code would do what you meant. Iter tools provides you with chain. And chain allows you to concatenate any two things that can be iterated over. And that makes sense. You iterate over the first one to exhaustion. And then you pick up with the next one. And then you pick up with the next one, and so forth and so on. This is a helper. It allows you to just chain objects together. Similarly, there is another helper. There are helpers like t, repeat, and cycle. So maybe you want to repeat elements. You might want to cycle through some elements. You might want to take a stream and split it into many parts. And finally, iter tools contains what I like to call algorithms. So you have something called take while. Maybe you have an infinite sequence of numbers, and you want to just take numbers up until some condition is met. Or you want to drop numbers up until some condition is met. You have both take while and drop while in iter tools. You also have a product for the Cartesian product, combinations and permutations, um, and other, other, other algorithms for dealing with iterables. So what is the motivation for this talk or for generators? I think that we can talk about it in terms of efficiency, both memory efficiency, CPU efficiency, and maybe the efficiency of how we write our code, how we model our code, and how we conceptualize our problems. I think the easiest answer for why I should use generators in my code is one of memory efficiency. So we're going to see this example a couple times over. We have a function called pairwise. Now what pairwise does is it takes some sequence and it gives you subsequent pairs of them. So for the sequence one to, from 0 to 9, it'll give you 0, 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 4. This actually tends to be a very, very useful helper function that pops up all over the place in code that I write. Um, I've been in interviews where they ask, how do you solve this problem? And they're expecting a 30-minute answer. And I say, actually, here's how you write pairwise out. And with pairwise, it's only a five-minute answer. Actually, in the original notes for this, I have one or two of those interview questions. I think one of them is asked at Spotify. So if you want to apply to Spotify, look through the notes. And one of the interview questions is in there. So in this, in this variation of it, you can see that it's using just a function, returning and processing the entire calculation. So I can do a pairwise of numbers from 0 to 9, and it's fine. But could I do a pairwise of numbers from 0 to a, a million? No, I'd probably run out of memory. And you could see that I'd have to wait for the entire list to be built. So I'm using an enormous amount of memory where, in many cases, I only want to know what one of these windows looks like at any one time. I don't need to know the entire result. So in the case of a generator, I merely simplify this. You can see it's a little bit shorter, a little bit easier to read. And I just yield values immediately. And I can both do the pairwise of 0 to 9 and concretize it or materialize it or, or make it into a material list just by calling list on it. And I can do the same thing over elements to a million. And if I only want to look at one element at a time, I no longer need to allocate a million elements of storage in order to produce these pairs. I only need to allocate exactly one pair at a time. So for example, if I were looking at an infinite stream of data, for example, I were piping from standard in to my program, with this pairwise, I don't need to wait for the stream to hit EOF. With the other one, I'd have to wait for all the data to come in before I could even process it. And I would also need, with the other one, I'd also need memory equal to, to buffer all of the input. Here, I only need memory equal to exactly one pair. Now, I talked about iter tools right before talking about this because this is my favorite per implementation of, of pairwise. It's a generalized one, which gives you pairs of any, uh, or windows of any size. It looks a little bit complicated, but if you look at it very closely, it's actually a very, very simple application of fundamental structures and error tools. So what you do is you take the initial stream and you copy it some number of times over. So if you want windows of size 3, you take the stream and you copy it three times. You get three references that can be iterated over independently that are self-buffering. Then for each one of them, you advance them a little bit. So if you have the streams, if you have the numbers from 0 to 9, you take 0 to 9, 0 to 9, 0 to 9. You advance one of them up a little bit, so that's 0 to 9, then 1 to 8, then the other one up a little bit more, so it's 0 to 9, 1 to 8, sorry, 0 to 9, 1 to 9, and then 2 to 9. And then you zip them across, so you get 0, 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, 3, 4, 5, and it works. And that's all this does. It enumerates them, well, it tees them, then it advances them, then it zips them together, and you end up with a very short, very efficient formulation of this that is totally lazy and only ever allocates memory equal to the size of the window that you need. So here's that in place. 
Now, some people like to talk about time efficiency with generators, and there are arguments going in both directions. If you see Saul's numbers talk tomorrow, he may have some of these examples in here with regards to optimization using number. This is just a very simple primality checker. So you give it a number, and it does trial division to figure out if the number is prime. I implement it as a nice little generator using all, and then you're just checking to see that, you know, do you have any remainder when you divide by each one of these numbers? And you can see that here's some timing for it with a very big prime number. I think that's a Mersenne prime. I don't remember. This is either a Mersenne prime or it's one of the ones that Euler discovered. This may be the one Euler discovered late in his life. Imagine, like your entire life is spent just looking for prime numbers. What a... That's not a prime. Is it? Oh, yeah, it ends with four. So maybe it's one plus that. I actually don't remember where the example came from. Well, so there you go. And you can see the human implementation of prime checking is way more efficient than the computer one because you can just look at it. Um, here, here, but back to the actual example. Here's the version of it written in just very plain, you know, standard Python. And you can see that this one's actually substantially faster than the generator one. The reason for this is that there is a cost in creating a generator expression and actually creating the generator object. And that cost is quite a substantial amount of overhead. So in some cases, you may find that turning your code from very, very plain Jane, you know, Python 101 into this fancy one-liner generator actually hurts you with regards to speed. Um, however, I have one example that I, I really, I keep showing people, but I really hate to show people, um, which shows the exact opposite case. So this pairwise, I have, I called it by threes here, but I have the exact same implementation here that I had before. And I have it written in not very good C++. And the last time I gave this talk, somebody asked about, um, the last time I gave this talk, somebody asked about buffering. So you can see I even put a line to do some buffering stuff, but it didn't change the timings of it at all. But I wrote this in really junky C++. And you can see this one is much longer and harder to read. This is even generalized. This can, take in, this can give you windows of any size. This one only gives you windows of size 3. And I can run this on numbers from 1 to a million. And I'll show you just from 1 to 5 before timing it. So look at 1 to 5. So it gives you 1, 2, 3, 2, 3, 4, 3, 4, 5. So that one works. That's a dodgy unit test if you ever saw one. <coughs> and that one works. And let's time them. So the top is C++ and the bottom is Python. And you can see the Python one's faster. Now, sometimes when I run this, the Python one's slightly slower. Sometimes it's slightly faster. I think the real take home here is that sometimes with problems that are maybe I.O. bound, you can actually get substantial speed benefits out of using Python. Well, you can get substantial benefits out of using Python. You can get in the same range of speed with much nicer code. Code that's written in pure Python where you don't have to worry about I mean, look, look, how many, look how fraught with peril the C++ code could be if maybe I index out of that buffer. I have no checks. I, I'm losing so much in terms of expressivity, in terms of generality, in terms of checks. For what? For maybe a slight speed advantage, and in this case, not even a speed advantage. So there is an argument to be made in both directions. I personally don't think that, the, that, th that this is a very compelling reason to use generators. I think the more compelling one is to say that if you were to model your code with these large structures, so say you write NYs and it's just slow, and you, you, you do some profiling, you find that that's a really slow part of your code. Well, one nice thing about generators is because their protocol is so simple, it's very easy to just lift them out and replace them with versions written in C. And this is exactly the iter tools module. The iter tools module are, they're not, they are C implementations of what could just as easily have been written as generators. And they actually tend to be very efficient. So I have an example of this NYS written in C right here. And you can see it's 100 lines of code. It's almost entirely boilerplate. So it's actually very easy. This here is probably the entire meat of it. So all I'm doing is just getting the values. You can see I'm doing index plus 1, mod 3. So I'm just doing by 3s. It's very, actually, very easy to write in C. And I'm getting all the benefits of performance that I can get by making these um, static assumptions that I get when I write it in C. However, I think the most compelling 
reason to use generators is modeling. And when I talk about, oops, when I talk about modeling, I mean the way that we conceptualize and model our code, and not what I do on the weekends for Victoria's Secrets Catalog. Uh, some people are still paying attention. That's good. Um, what I mean is that you can immediately see that if you had a program that is a step of, of uh, that, that can be decomposed into small processing steps, like an audio filter or a network filter, where you can break each computation to a small independent piece, which does some computation on data and sends it off to the next unit. You could model it as a pipeline. So just like in Unix, we love to do find, dash, iname, star.py, print zero, pipe, xargs, pipe, while read line, pipe, so forth and so on. We can actually write code in that same style, very nicely decoupled in Python, using generators as a fundamental building block. And, and that's actually a very successful, or that's a very promising way to model your problem. However, I think that there are some additional things. I like to say that generators free us from presumptions. So the first presumption I think that generators free us from is return types. You can see I have a Fibonacci sequence, and this has popped up a couple times in the notes. Um, but I have a Fibonacci sequence written in a function form. And it has this buffer, RV, that gives you RV. And it's running for the Fibonacci numbers up to but not exceeding the number n. So this is the Fibonacci numbers up to but not exceeding 20. Although there's probably a bug, this should be equals. Um, here, I, I, get, I get the answer. It's a list. And if I want it as a set, I get it as a set. If I want it as a tuple, I get it as a tuple. But you can see that I'm presuming what the return value type should be. I'm presuming that you want a list, right? Map in Python 2 presumes that you want a list. But maybe you don't. Maybe you want to map elements and then put them into a set. And you can think that you're not only wasting memory, because in order to turn this list into this set, you have to have both of them in memory at the same time. So you're doubling the amount of memory. And these are very large. That can be a substantial burden. But also, you're taking the time to convert from one data type you didn't really want into another data type you wanted. And there's always these arguments. Should this return a tuple? Should this return a, should this return a set? Should this return a list? When, if you were to write this as a generator, you have to make no presumptions. And the user can choose what data type he wants in the end. So he can choose, I want a list. I want a set. I want a tuple. And if you look at the timing, we not only save on memory from having to have both of those in memory at the same time, but we also get a little faster performance here in that you don't need to do this redundant calculation from the list into another list or from the, set into a, from the list into a set. You can dump it right into the structure that you want, and you're done with it. I think also they, they, they free us from a presumption about how we want to use the values that, we, that we're getting at. So we could think that there are two ways for us to write this eager Fibonacci function. The first way is we could write it so that it gives us Fibonacci numbers up to but not exceeding n. So this will give us, for Fibonacci 20, it'll give us 13 but not 21 because 21 exceeds the value 20 that we put in. Or we could do, and this is always wrong in the notes, we could do the first, fib, the first n Fibonacci numbers. So here we're getting the first 20 Fibonacci numbers. And you could say, well, how, what if we wanted both behaviors? What if our users wanted to get it? This one sometimes, and the other one the other times. And most likely, what people would do is they'd put an n parameter and an m parameter, or write two functions, and it's absolute nonsense. Why would you need two functions to guess what the user wants to do with the values that you have, when you could just write this as a generator, make absolutely no presumption about which values that the user wants? So here, I don't, I don't run up to, but not larger than 20. I don't run the first 20. I just give you an infinite stream of numbers. And you get to choose exactly which ones you want by using iter tools to pull out those values. So I've freed myself from having to presume how you want these values out. I just produce an infinite stream for you. And then you have total freedom to decide how you want to consume them and what parts of this calculation you want. You can get the first 20 values by using iSlice. You can get values up to but not exceeding 20 by using takeWhile. You could think for a more complex example. Somebody might say, well, we want to put a flag, which gives us values from 10 to 20, but not ones which are odd, and so forth and so on, where all of that functionality can be pulled out of the function and put into the hands of the user. This frees up something like this from a lot of presumptions about how it's going to be used. 
But most, most frustratingly for me in my life is a presumption about which values we really want to use. So here's our, here's our eager Fibonacci function. And I add a little sleep in here, right? What if I only want the first value out of this? Now you could think that this may not be a, this may not be a Fibonacci sequence. Maybe this is doing a database lookup of some sort. Maybe it creates a cursor and it pulls all the rows. And I know, you know there's, a, there's a set query and I only know that I want one row. Well, you can see when I time it, I get the entire cost of that entire computation. Because this is going to run eagerly and hit this sleep 20 times until it completes. Whereas in the case of the generator formulation, I pull out exactly the one value that I want and I'm done. And I only incur the cost for the values that I want. I only incur the cost of the computation for the values that I want. So if this were you know, some cursor and the generator maintains a context for that cursor and it does some complex SQL queries, I may only have to do the work, do the, you know, take the burden of that network traffic, actually perform the query, you know, look up into the table for the results that I want. And maybe if for some reason my program wants to terminate early, I don't have to wait for you to come back with the entire set of the query for me to terminate early. I can choose as a user of this function how I want to use this value. I have a very long example showing this in, in terms of business dates. So one thing that whenever I see business dates in, in big business systems, they always put a holiday calendar on a database. And what they do is whenever they look up a business date, some, somebody writes it in, they don't write the closed form solution. And I really someday need to give a talk about the closed form solution for this. But what they do is they say, is today a business date? Yes. If it's not, then you go to the next date. Is that a business date? And they iterate. And what if you wanted five business dates in a row? Well, what you'd do is you'd call today minus one, calculate business dates, or roll back minus one, roll back minus two, roll back minus three, roll back minus four, roll back minus five. And you're going to hit that SQL query to get the range of all the holidays that are stored in your holiday calendar five times. Whereas if you were to write this as a generator, what you could do is yield an infinite sequence of holidays going in either direction, provided to the user, and the user can just step through it as he desires. And that sequence could do one SQL query, wouldn't need any additional caching, wouldn't need any memoization. It just does the one query, finds all the business dates, and then, or finds all the holidays in the holiday calendar, and then provides values as the user requests them. So if you wanted 10 values, you might have to do a little bit more computation. But if you only wanted one value, you'd only have to do the computations commensurate with the size of the res return set that you wanted. Additionally, I find that we, there's a tendency for functions in large systems to gain all sorts of knobs and buttons and modalities. So it gains a this mode or a this knob or, 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 some, additional, or, or some additional structure. And one of the techniques that we have for reducing this is basic functional programming. So they say, well, instead of passing a flag equals true or flag equals false into the function, you can better implement that modality by passing a function into the function and having a call. Pass a call back in. And, you can, and then you don't have to, inside the function, say, if function to call equals A, do this. If function to call equals B, do this. You can implement all that functionality by injecting that via the formal parameters. Well, generators offer you the same, the same benefit but with a slightly different approach. So here I have what I, this is actually my favorite example from these notes, or my second favorite example from these notes. So it starts with this little pumped guy. So we talked in the beginning about pumping and priming, and there's no way to avoid it. It's really messy. This is just something that you have to do. It's just part of using generators. But here we have something very interesting. Let's start with this. This is greedy. What's, the, what's a greedy algorithm? A greedy algorithm is an algorithm where local choices, wherever, when you make the most optimal local choice, it turns into the, o o over the course of solving the entire problem, that results in the most optimal global choice. So you make the most optimal choice right now, and over the course of making those choices and solving the problem, you end up with the most optimal solution for the problem. So we have certain problems that can be approached with a greedy algorithm, like counting change. You have drawers of change, and you pick from the biggest drawer until you can't pick any more. Then you pick from the next drawer, then the next drawer, then the next drawer, then the next. Um, by the way, these notes are using American denominations. I don't know what Euro denominations are, so I apologize. I think there's a 20 in there. So maybe we have to change that for this example. 1, 5, 20. Is that good? Yeah, yeah there we go. And we have a, oh, we have a 50 too. That's right. So what I do for this example 
is I pretend that I pretend that the cash register has an infinite number of each tray, an infinite number of 20s, an infinite number of 50s, an infinite number of 100s, an infinite number of coins. That's what repeat does. Then I take coins from that until the predicate says you can't take any more. And all the predicate does is it says you've had enough. If you take one more coin, you'll, you'll blow the, the, amount, the amount. So if you wanted to make $7 of change, you take a 5. And the predicate will say, you can't take another five because you'll get 10, which is greater than seven. Mm -hmm. So you'll go to the next door and you'll say, okay, I'll take a one. I can take another one and keep going. And all I do is I repeat the items infinitely, take while the predicate's true, and then just chain the results together to make one, one list, just to flatten it. And you can see, with this approach, I can solve the change counting problem. So all the complexity of this problem is here to nicely pretty print it out. But here, I list out my denominations. I create my predicate, and all my predicate does is take values until, you can no until the next value would cause you to go over what your, what your target was. So I say, OK, I want to create a predicate, and this is the target. It's the amount, and I'm choosing a random amount. And then I find the coins, and I print them out. And you can see, I solve this coin changing problem in a very general way. And I solve it so generally that one line later, instead of coins, I put Roman numerals, and I solve the problem of converting from uh, from Western numerals into Roman numerals. And you can see all I've changed in this is now I'm picking a year and the inputs are different. But I fundamentally solve this problem of picking things in a very general way such that from the outside I just control what, what the items that I'm picking from are and I solve the problem. I really like this example and I think it can show how you can substantially change the way that you think about your code in order to model it. And look, I solved this in about so, so uh, in about Five, five lines of code? Well, no, sorry. And about 20 lines of code. No, less than that. The predicate's only this. So I've solved about 20 lines of code. Two very different problems. And you could think any problem that you have that's amenable to a greedy algorithm, you could solve using exactly this. Now, the one assumption I've made is that the, pre that the, the target is a value that you can c compare against. But if you implemented the target as some custom object that had comparators, you really could solve any greedy algorithm using just this one structure. So just like iter tools provides us with these generalizations and these algorithms, I can do the same thing using generators and modeling things a little bit differently using coroutines. So I want to get to the meat of this talk and the reason why it's called the showdown showcase or showcase showdown. So whenever I didn't feel like going to school, I would pretend to be sick and I'd stay home. And you know, your parents are off at work, so you turn on the TV and there is no good TV on at 2 in the afternoon. What is on instead are game shows like Wheel of Fortune and Jeopardy and The Price is Right. So I'm sure that you guys know about The Price is Right. This is, this is The Price is Right with Drew Carey. And this is the actual game, the Showdown Showcase, or Showcase Showdown. And you probably know about it because it exists in Spain <laughs> as this show. In fact, it turns out that The Price is Right is a global phenomenon. And they even have A Price is Right in China with a guy who's exactly the Chinese Bob Barker, you know, giving away prizes in exactly the same way. <coughs> so, what, I, what we did at our meetups, so in NYC Python we have these big meetups and we get a lot of books from Pearson and from O'Reilly and we get tickets from PyData Conference and from O'Reilly's Cultivate Conference. They want us to give them away to our users. And one way we can give away is we just give them to our friends but I think a more fun way is to do a little live coding exercise and to find a way to randomly select somebody from the group to give it to. And that's how the Showcase Showdown started. It started with this, which I live coded. So I went up to the stage, and while people were being counted off, I typed this in from memory, and it worked. And all this is is a very simple application of iter tools. So I create a random, I create an infinite sequence of numbers from 0 to 63. So we counted off from 0 because we're programmers. There were 64 people in the room. Actually, there were 63 people in the room because rand range doesn't include the endpoint. And I created a set of pauses that paused it, and I printed it to the screen. And I'll show you what this looks like. All it does is, just like the wheel, it picks somebody randomly, but it has one really neat side effect. Actually, it has literally a side effect, uh, which you'll see. The side effect that it has is that the numbers slow down as it gets to the end. Just like the wheel, when you jump up and you spin the wheel, it slows down and your heart starts to pound. So you can see it's slowing down <laughs> and we don't know who's going to be picked. 
So you can see it slowed down and people's hearts are beating. They don't know if they're going to win. Well, we decided that we didn't want to use the same example every time. Because frankly, you know, it gets a little boring. You want to mix it up. So what I decided to do for the next time we did this, we had a very finance data related one, was I wanted to show a Mersenne, uh, the Mersenne Twister. Now, in previous version of this talk, I've erroneously said that Python uses Witchman Hill internally for random number generation. And this hasn't been true since 2.3. Internally, Python, Python's random number generator is, in fact, the Mersenne Twister. But I decided to write this out as just a simple exercise, giving an infinite sequence of Mersenne primes. And you can see that, with the exception of all this little bit twiddling, it's actually a pretty simple piece of code. It's only 10 lines long. And the bit twiddling is unavoidable, because that's just how the algorithm is written. You can't really avoid having to do things like this, or this, or this guy right here. But we, we, we did that, and we ended up with the exact same example, but the random numbers were from our own little random number generator. But I, I started to think, and I was starting to get a little dissatisfied, because the tension level wasn't high enough. I wanted to better simulate the wheel. Because in the price is right, what happens is the wheel slows down, and there's that little flipper. And when it gets close to the flipper, Sometimes it goes backwards. So sometimes you think you've won, and the wheel goes back, and you lost. <laughs> Same thing with Wheel of Fortune. You know, you get really close to winning $1,000, and then one more, and you're bankrupt. So I thought, how do I make the wheel go backwards? Well, I think our standard object-orientated formulation of it would look like this. We have some wheel object, and we have some spin, and we have all these little methods that represent these naturalistic things that the wheel can do. But I feel that there's a limitation to what you can achieve with this. It's very hard to understand, and the protocol is very complex, and it is enormously hard to test all the different states and modalities of this guy right here. So I thought, why don't we use a generator for this? So let's start with something very simple. We'll create a wheel generator. It's just a coroutine, and all it does is it takes some concrete iterable, because you have to put it into a list, and it just returns elements from it in one direction. And each time, you go in one each time you get one element out, you can tell it to go backwards, or you can tell it to go forwards. So you can change the fundamental direction in which it moves. So I'll show you this in action. <coughs> and I think this is Python 3. So if I do a wheel with the numbers to 4, and it has some, so if I get the next value out, you can see it just goes, and then it just keeps rotating. And if I tell it to go, there's a constant here called backward. If I tell it, if I do wheel.send backward, you can see now, now when I get values out, it's going backwards, and I can tell it to go forward again. Right? This is a very, very specific but very generalized view of what the wheel is. It's just some way to iterate through numbers in one direction or the other. And you can think that this must be very easy to test. Because my tests for it just look like this. Direction backwards, you check. Direction forward to check. You can even actually customize whether it skips or not. So I've written the entire unit test, and this really tests all the different modes that this possibly could have. And I can take this very simple thing and, write, and build it up into the answer. So what I, what I did first was I built this spin thing. And the spin thing, it takes a wheel, and it takes some parameters for the velocity, and it just runs through numbers to the screen until sleeping, sleeping for some duration given some velocity function. And I had a transition guy, so that's just my curve for how I want it to slow down. Because you can tweak that and you know, slow it down really gently, or slow it down really fast and then gently. But I thought, can I make this any better? Because this has a little bit too many toggles. Look how many arguments there are up here. And I don't like things which have that many arguments, because I feel that explodes the number of unit tests you have to do. The number of unit tests you have to do is the Cartesian product of, of it's, the, it's the product type of all of the arguments, that, of all the formal arguments that you have in the generator. So I thought, can we, can we do it like this? Instead of spinning, the spinning only takes a wheel and a velocity. And the velocity just tells how long you sleep for. Now the velocity is just some function that gives you velocity numbers over time. This is really easy to test. Because the way I test it is, I can just print it out. And I can see the numbers go down to 0, right? I can make assertions of it. So I could say. I could, write a, I could write a very simple test saying, assert that it's monotonically decreasing, it's finite, it hits zero eventually, and that each value is less than the, the previous value unless the values are within some range. So I could write really, really nice tests around this because it's a very simple thing with very little toggles. And I take the velocities, and I take the spinning of the wheel, and I combine them together with my other generator, and I have a little spinner. And you can see I can customize this in a very interesting way. Namely, instead of having this transition, I have a friction. So now this guy just takes a function called friction, 
that tells you what the friction, what, how, how to model the friction of the velocity. How does the velocity change over time? Does it change very quickly? Does it change based on the initial value? So forth and so on. And then, so this is, this is what it looks like all together. And then with you know, a couple of pieces, you can see we can implement the players and the prizes. We can say this is the list of the winners. And we can print it out. And you end up looking like something looking like this, where it prints these guys out to the screen. And it can possibly move backwards at the end. So I wish that I had something to give away for you guys right now. But I can show you what this guy looks in action with a little bit of Encurse's magic added on as well. Um, so there it is in Python 3. So this is what it looks like in actual practice. <laughs> and I don't know, sometimes it goes backwards, sometimes it doesn't. But it does slow down. And you can see it's very little code to implement a very complex set of functionality with if you, if you saw this in the library, you could do an enormous amount with this because you can inject all the behavior that you want while still having that superstructure of, the, of what fundamentally it's trying to do. And you can see it's slowing down, and maybe it'll go backwards. Hope, hopefully it goes backwards this time. And you can see that th this whole list is actually no longer just random numbers. It's actually a concrete wheel, so, so these numbers actually stay in an order. Unfortunately, it didn't go backwards this time, but number 18, if you're in the room, you would have won. So that is the Showcase Showdown using generators and coroutines. And I think that, essentially, this is a very, very, uh, this is, I, I think that this is a very promising and very interesting technique for modeling your code. The, I'm, I'm James Powell. I would like to thank all of you for being here today. Fin de la cita. Oh. Does, does anyone have any questions for me? Here we go. Uh, hi James. One question. Was By the way, if you want to ask your question in Spanish, I have some translators in the audience here who will happily help you out. I wanted to know your, your opinion or your advice on using the syntax introduced in Python 3.3 for delegating the iteration with the yield, yield from. from. So the first example that I showed was this weird use of yield from within the generator expression. I think that we yield from is very nice in terms of allowing us to avoid when we have these recursive generators, this really ugly 4x in, and then you call the recursive call and the yield again. So in that, in that sense, it's actually a very nice immediate convenience. There are some, I think, unexplored areas or consequences of this. For example, prior to yield from, generators could only return none values. They could yield out values, but they could actually themselves only return none values. With yield from, now the yield from can actually return a value in its own form to, in order to <laughs> inject data back into the guy who is delegating to him. And as a consequence, there may be some interesting cases of what you can do. But otherwise, it seems like a very nice convenience that was added. So I'll show you just very quickly for those of you who may not be familiar with it. In Python 3, there was... Um, so I should put this with an argument. So we have re regular yield. But say that, this, say that we want to flatten something. We want to flatten some structure all the way to the bottom. What we might do is we might, do, we might write it like this. Um, def flatten takes excess. And for x in excess, no, if for x in So we might have written it like this previously. Otherwise, we else yield x. Is that, is, that, is that what I want to do? And then flatten. Oh. Oh, so I, I, I need to figure out the condition there. But essentially, when we're calling this recursively, we need to have this subdelegation. This has been re replaced by a yield from statement, where you can then yield from this guy. And that's how the original syntax example works, or the, the original what does this do example works. It actually is taking a generator that is a list of lists, or a sequence of, an iterable of iterables, 
and it's, yield, it's delegating to that next layer of iterables. Let me see if I can, I have to think about this to get this quite right. Oh, so I think that would be, f so I think, I think that should be, maybe I'll try one more time to see if I get it right. Otherwise my reputation might be tarnished. <laughs> so else yield excess maybe? Over yeah, I do, but I was looping. Uh, if it's an iterable, okay, we'll, 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 we'll work with this together later. Is there any other questions? <coughs> Otherwise, I'm just going to keep working on this one example until I get it. <laughs> Nobody else has any other questions? Oh. You have, you have a. Mm -hmm. So. So I no way to um, keep the value and then increment or um, so so the question was about um, C plus plus eleven introduces its own abstract notion of iterability. So Java's had this for a very long time, C sharp has it, Python has it clearly, and in C plus plus they wanted to avoid all of this ugliness with having to create const iter iterators, iterators and reverse iterators, and they implemented a uh, policy for or a, or a protocol for doing this yeah. with nicer so syntax C++, uh, with for each right yeah. using boost for each mm -hmm. does it use boost for each no look for the next one in python uh, oh, you Always you want a value, it's the next one. If you want three or four times uh, the same value, the first or the second, uh, you, you can't. You only can take the, that value once. Yes, so this is one qualification. This is one interesting qualification for the use of generators. Namely, one, of the f one thing that's very hard to write is how do you write a peak for a generator? For how do you write an abstract peak? Something that gets the first element of some iter iter iterable irrespective of what that iterable is. So for a list, you do list of zero. For a tuple, you do tuple of zero, string, string of zero. That's easy. For a generator, you can't do next because the moment you do that computation, you've lost the underlying value. With any, with any iter iterator, the moment you iterate over it, you lose any access to the previous computation or the previous value. So how do you write peak so you get only the first value out? And it turns out that it's very difficult to do without asking the caller to make a copy of the the generator himself. And so one thing that you could think about as a consequence of this is that part of the fundamental semantics of using generators in Python is that if you have a function that takes a generator, you should be clear whether you use it. And you might have to assume that every time you pass a generator to somebody else, there is direct ownership of that generator being transferred, meaning you no longer can iterate through that guy. You have to assume that the function you pass it through has exhausted it and there's no more values. Because otherwise, you need to implement some very complex ownership semantics over who's iterated over how much of this. With the stream data processing approach, that avoids this problem by having each chunk in the processing chain just ex consume the entirety of the previous chunk. So you don't, have the, the, you don't have a case of taking a generator and passing it over here and expecting only a couple values taken out and then passing it over here and expecting a couple values taken out. Because that would require some very complex ownership semantics. And generators, the moment you get a value out of it, you can't, you can't ever revisit that value. Other questions? A uh, couple of questions, it's quick. First is, does Python allow to use uh, yield inside lambdas? Yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> so, so when yield was, prior to the coroutine days, yield was a statement like the print statement, and so you couldn't yield from a lambda. When yield became a... I don't know, when, it, when, it became, when, when yield w became an expression or when yield became capable of returning a value, you started to be able to do things like you know, y equals yield x. Mm -hmm. And then once you do that, then sure, you can, put, you can put one in a lambda. I'm not sure what it would really do. So you do x yield xs. And then if you look at g, who knows what this is. So it just gives you a generator object, but it's not, it's not particularly useful other than in some pretty 
ugly abuses of the syntax. But it, 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 because it's now an expression that can return a value, that's... Um, okay, and the other question is, how generator uh, interact with slices? So, so for slicing, you can't slice it using the concrete slicing approach. So say we have... Like that, right? You can't do this because you don't know how big the generator is. You don't know how many values there are. This syntax doesn't work. But what you can do is you can do I slice. So, whoops. And you can get, you can I slice it from one value to the other. All I slice does is. I slice is consuming the first items to reach exactly. one. Exactly. Exactly. Select one and mm -hmm. two and exactly. So if I were to make a, if I were to make this guy, say I, I said, and I said yield from x range ten, and I did g i equals g, and I do i slice of g i from three to six. The moment I get those values out, oh. The moment I get those values out, well, it's too late. I've already I've already sliced into this guy. So, and then the next value from this guy is going to be 6, because I've already exhausted all the, all the initial values. Okay. And there's a question over here? The, there's a last question over here. The people in the back are getting antsy. Please? You can make the argument, well, first, if you talk to any of the core developers, they will tell you that they believe imperative programming is the way that people think and the best attempt approach at programming as opposed to wild functional approaches. They will say that they are supportive of functional programming, but they think that imperative programming is maybe the best overarching strategy. So Python, I don't think, will ever look as, uh, I don't think Python will ever have monad transformers. <laughs> I don't think it'll ever have arrows. Uh, but approaches that you can use successfully in Haskell, like considering state to be a first class value, or do, you know, doing things like maps and lists and reduces, can be also used in Python as successfully. So you can learn things from Haskell, but I think that the very uh, ideologically pure approach to functional programming is not something that will ever come to Python. I think that's the last question. I hope you enjoyed this. <laughs>